one. Right. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, want to thank you to the for joining us for the Griffin Spalding County Board of Education virtual fiscal year 21 budget work session. And uh, so I think we have all of our board members present online. And uh, if you would, if, uh, we'll call this to order. And if you would place yourself on mute unless you need to talk that way, if there's any background noise or anything going on, it won't be disruptive. And so, board members, I would entertain a motion for the adoption of our agenda. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by raising your right hand so we can see it. Ms. Brown and those opposed? Okay. Your, your video was delayed. Sorry about that. So that looks like it was 5-0. All right. Uh, our presentation, our action item for the uh, school system financial presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have um, finally come to the night of being able to do a budget presentation for fiscal 21. We started the process, you know, back in the early part of the spring. And then thanks to all the... Um, uh, COVID issues not only did it you know, impact our ability to get together, but it also impacted the state's ability to com complete their work as far as the state budget goes, which is kind of unusual. So um, we considered a lot of options on how to on how to move forward with it. But the final analysis felt like that that the what the um, what the state would do with their budget has such a significant impact on our on our budget, almost two thirds of our uh, budget comes from state um, appropriations under the QBE uh, Act or uh, other types of grant allotments from that, that uh, it would be best if we um, delayed completing our budget until we knew exactly where the state budget was going to sit. Therefore, you'll recall back in the month of June, we did a continuing resolution to allow us to continue spending in the month of July to operations. I had to spend no more than one twelfth of the prior year's appropriated budget in that, and so um, until we can get to the point of having the budget adopted, uh, I don't think we won't we'll get the budget adopted by the end of July. So tonight on the regular board agenda, you'll also see another continuing resolution for the month of August to allow us to to continue operations in that month while we continue considering this budget leading up to final adoption. I hope somewhere around August 18 work, work session night would be uh, our hope, hope for target to do final adoption of the budget. And we'll talk about what needs to go uh, on in that in the, in the meantime in a few minutes. So we're gonna do a presentation tonight, overview of the budget tonight, what's in it, what the basic assumptions were, the basic parameters, the limitations, where we think this is gonna have a practical impact. And then we will, um, uh, talk about the uh, right to place this budget on first reading as part of our regular board meeting that uh, does not want the budget in place. It simply begins the process of consideration. And after that, we can set as many workshops, et cetera, as the board would like, uh, leading, leading to the final adoption. So we're gonna have a couple of suggested public hearing nights as well. We will also advertise the budget in the local newspaper as we're required to do and uh, and meet all of those requirements. Um, as you know, we, we've changed um, chief financial officers during the middle of this, and Iron Jones is, um, is working very hard and coming up to speed very nicely. But uh, this is a tough time of year and a tough uh, place to, to plug yourself in. So we have again with us tonight our guest, Mr. Ryan McNamore. Ryan has been kind enough to help uh, continue the process of putting the budget together for us. And I'm going to let him and let he and, and Byron kind of lead us through this presentation. Uh, and I'll make some comments along the way as well. And then when we get to the end, we will see if there are any questions of a general nature. And then we can set up workshops, et cetera, to go from there. So I see, uh, I think Ms. Mullins is going to um, drop a PowerPoint for us. And I will turn it over to uh, Mr. McLemore and Mr. Jones to work us to uh, walk us through the PowerPoint. 
All right. Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see you all again. And it is nice to finally get a budget before you. Like uh, Mr. Smith said, we, we were hoping to have this a, a whole lot earlier than now. Uh, and that's had its own implications that we'll talk about in a little while. But um, we finally do have a product. I do want to give a caveat to this product. The basic assumption we are running on in presenting this budget is a normal calendar year. Uh, for the most part, you can count on most of your expenditures being normal despite the configurations that the board ultimately chooses uh, for running the upcoming year. The caveat to that being uh, you could then be underspent in some areas and then lose revenue in other areas. And just like in the spring when we had to do a large transfer from our savings in the general fund over to help subsidize the nutrition fund. Those are the kind of things that you want to be mindful of as we present this budget and talk about these numbers uh, really as a starting point. And then as the year goes on and as you learn more about our situation and make other decisions, ultimately we can bring back amended budgets uh, that will reflect those changes and how we plan on handling them. Uh, the other big statement, just to reiter reiterate what Mr. Smith said, was that this is um, purely a workshop where we want to go through the information with you. Most of you have done this for many, many years, uh, where we present the information. You have a PDF uh, copy of the entire budget book, which should give you uh, hopefully the detail you need to understand and make decisions moving forward. But uh, that document after this meeting is something that we will attach to the finance page of the website and we will advertise as well so that anyone has access to it. But uh, that's just a, a reminder that it's a reference point for you that if you want to get more into the detail, whereas we're going to hit more top level uh, in this presentation and then some of the inclusions uh, that, have, that are new uh, to us. So just to start off with, as we always do, our total appropriations right under 140 million. And so for the most part, uh, the biggest piece of that is our general fund, which runs our basic operations. Our special revenue fund is, is usually supplemental to your basic operations. Those are all your federal grants and some state grants. Capital projects, uh, we, we budget out the remaining uh, projects that are already slated uh, and an estimate of really for us the first year of SPLA 6, which will be pretty limited as we collect that money. The nutrition fund and debt service fund where we'll uh, go through and, and show what we have left on that. But uh, the, again, this is going to be based off of, of a full normal uh, calendar year uh, using these numbers. Joni, if you could go to the next one. All right, this is just a breakdown of our state revenues. The biggest variable that we had to wait on was the state. Uh, we had a general estimate at the time when we were looking at this really in May, where they initially talked about the 14% cut. Uh, then it, it uh, got scaled back and ultimately was 10% cut to our QBE amounts. Uh, but the fortunately for us, the equalization grant was not part of that cut. And for those, uh, you that, if you recall, the equalization grant, uh, it's effectively a, an equity grant for low wealth systems uh, where they equalize your uh, taxable value of your digest up to a certain threshold of what is considered the wealthier districts. And for us, it's a significant amount of money. You can see it's over $10 million. Uh, so this is a very important source of revenue for us. So I was I was very pleased by the fact that they left that out of the cut. When you look at total, total QBE earnings and you see that change there of, of the negative 1.6, what that really encompasses is a decrease to the uh, contribution that the employer is required to make to TRS. Uh, so for the most part, that flows through the QBE formula, but at the same time, we pay less. Uh, so as a whole, it works out into our favor because we typically find more people that are on the formula. Uh, so, but they'll cut that out of the earnings. So we had a decrease for teacher retirement. And then we also had a, a uh, decrease in FTE, uh, which affected this. 
You can see look five mil share, share is basically the same, uh, but the equalization grant did it go up fairly significantly and, and the prior year went up almost two, I think it was over $2 million. Uh, so this has been a, it, it's a positive, I guess, uh, in some regards for our funding, it's a negative as commentary to, to uh, our county uh, because it does relate to the county's taxable wealth. And then the austerity reduction, Mr. Holmes, it's it's back, right? And so yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, we we had a couple of years of reprieve from the austerity reduction. I think uh, that they started around two thousand three originally, and accumulated over fifty million dollars over time. Uh, the uh, prior uh, governors effectively whittled it down to to nothing, um, where we had the the formula earnings but this is the way that the cut was administered so for everybody's uh, understanding uh, in in law in the qbe formula it spits out a number that basically says based off of the fte that you have this is the amount that you earn in law and the austerity reduction is a line item that is right below the output of that formula that just takes off an amount uh, in this case according to about 10 percent uh, for what the state can actually fund. So we'll see, this may be the beginning of a long road back, um, but almost $6 million for us just straight off the top. And nursing and transportation uh, had some, some uh, those actually should be uh, decreases. I had them as positive there's, but some slight decreases. They were subject to the cut as well. Uh, Mr. Sure. Mr. McLemore, can I ask yeah. you uh, on the on the uh, that five mil share was that was from from the state or local? Okay, okay, local. So it's so, it's our local. So, so what 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 caused uh, you know looking back at at the report on the collections throughout the throughout the year? What what did we fall short on on that 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 uh that five five mil share? Well, that the local five mil shares equates to basically five effective uh, mills of property tax for your county and effective means that they will, they take the sales ratio study where they determine whether or not you're undervalued or overvalued uh, in, in a sampling of properties that have sold throughout the year compared to what they were on the digest for. So if your house was um, on the digest for uh, 200,000 and it actually sold for, you know, 250,000, uh, then the digest would be considered undervalued for that, that piece of that study. And so they raise that, uh, to equate to what, uh, would be 40%, 40% of the, uh, assessed values of your, your tax digest for everybody around the state based off of that study. So it's variable from year to year and little amounts depending on what actually sold in the year and your properties just that study itself can can make changes here or there for what uh, your five mills is worth on, on the uh if you don't mind on the nursing fund uh i know we get a large percentage of that from from the uh hospital authority what was that where we were we, we fell short on that i know six seven thousand dollars may not seem like a lot to most people but you know when 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 they get down to what the nurses actually have to use to do what they do you know that that's that to me that's that's significant so what where do we fall short on the nursing fund did that come it's, from the hospital authority this right here is purely state money it's state money yeah if you look at our allotment it's a cat it's called a categorical grant right uh, just like transportation and it was it was part of the overall percentage cuts that the state did to everything okay okay so all of this is basically uh from the cut that the state did yes okay all right okay we just as, a, as a point of reference it's in the special revenue fund the hospital authority grant but that has decreased as well mm. uh, so it's it's now around two hundred seventy five thousand. So, whereas we used to get about 350 at its height, but it's been kind of variable each year, depending on which grants they fund and award. 
uh, but that has decreased as well. Okay. Thank you, sir. Ryan, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, this is Byron. I just wanted to make a comment here, and, and the, the board may be aware of this, but the equalization grant, you may have educated them on this in the past, runs about two years in arrears. So there, there may be a catch-up effect on this in a year or two based on our, our millage rate. Uh, so I just want to point that out, even though it's high, uh, higher this year, which helps us in this situation, that could be a factor in a year or two. And also the decrease in FTE, which I know there's a slide in a couple about that, that decrease in FTE, if we could, you know, find a way for those children to, you know, to, to be welcome, you know, to, to know that they're welcome here and, and, you know, whatever we can do to attract those more student count here will help us in that QBE count in the future. Because is that if that continues to go down, that would also affect QBE earnings. So two little factors I just wanted to point out uh, that we may want to keep focused on in, in the subsequent years. Yeah, and to, and to add to that, um, we'll talk about, I guess, in the next slide or two, but you have to also factor in the millage rate that you actually levy. And so that equalization grant, while it's worked out really well for Griffin Spalding for the past several years, you may hear the thunder behind me. There's thunder and lightning. Um, while it's worked in our favor, because it's a finite pot split amongst the, the school districts, it can change quickly. And uh, one, it just depends on who's actually in the pool for it to be split between. Whether uh, if you have a large school district that was originally not in that top 25% and now they are, now you're dividing uh, the finite pot between a lot more students. But as Byron mentioned, um, our FTE count plays a role in that, but our, our um, millage rate also plays a role in that. And so when we continue to roll back our millage rate, uh, we know that we're effectively receiving the same amount of money. That's the whole point of a rollback is, is your forego the increase in revaluations in your tax digest, but it also affects the equalization grant because they are uh, equalizing less of your mills that you have leveraged. So it hits us in multiple places when we, when we change our millage rate. So all that be said, that one is, a, it's an important one to focus on because while, while it's helping us right now, as Byron mentioned, there's a delay and there's some factors not working in our favor in that delay really hurt in the next year or two uh, when those factors start catching up to us. All right, Jenny. All right, and here's the projected millage. So we did build the budget. Off of uh, maintaining the same millage rate, 17.077. And just for the public's understanding, the board has uh, approved the rollback millage rate now for a, a number of years, at least five, uh, if not more, to where our millage rate went from, I remember, I believe the height was 19.64, and it's 19.64, 19.54, and has now gone down to 17.077. Uh, so it's been incremental until last year where we almost decreased in the mill. Uh, but this budget is is using the same uh, millage rate as an assumption. Again, based off of the actual tax digest that we'll get hopefully pretty soon and, and um, you'll where we'll be able to see what the revaluations were as well as new growth. Uh, the board will ultimately have to determine if they want to accept the rollback rate once again and, as I mentioned before, forego uh, any additional property taxes that are based off of those revaluations uh, or if we're going to use the rollback. The ad valorem tax, title ad valorem tax, just uh, as a refresher, is it's similar to a sales tax on motor vehicles. It's not a sales tax, but um, it's similar to that. You can think of it in, in that manner. Um, that has been very strong for us. The, the state approved legislation last year that went into effect in July of 19 that changed the distribution rate of that money uh, to really benefit one local governments, but particularly school systems. And we were, we were the beneficiary of that when we, before we hit uh, this whole 
uh, COVID crisis, we were well ahead on our collections. Uh, we had equated the prior year collections by the time we hit March, and we still had three collections remaining. Uh, so we want to be conservative in, in building the budget again. So what we did is we basically used revenue collections through March uh, to equate to our total FY21's collections um, in this budget. Uh, so it, 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 it equates to almost not having total avalorum tax for three months. You know, you're averaging that in for the entire year, but that, that's what it equates to. So hopefully uh, we've still been receiving total avalorum tax. It has decreased as, it, as we would expect, but it's not zero. And so we're hoping that that will be a, a good conservative estimate for us in here. <coughs> Let me let me also add something, Ryan. On this um, on this, we talked about the um, the millage rate, and we project we just used the, the same rate on the same on the same digest value for this purpose, which was no increase basically in property tax. As we look at this rollback rate uh, in future years, uh, as was mentioned earlier, it does have an impact on a portion of the state calculation, and so I think one of the things that's going to need to be done is is to see what future decreases in ad valorem tax rates will do to state revenue as well. And then decide how to handle that, whether that can be handled if, if the state revenue, because the millage rate has to be replaced in some way so that you can make a proper decision on that. That makes sense. And I think I'll go ahead and just mention this too, since Mr. Holmes brought up the local five uh, five mil share. Um, we also now have the, the senior freeze on the digest. Mm -hmm. And so when this is calculated, you'll see uh, the exemptions that relate to that if properties are revalued in any given year. So if, if there's a group of properties that are uh, owned by 65 and older and they are revalued and they technically on the books increase by some amount, that becomes an exemption for our property tax purposes, but that still is a factor in the calculation of your five mil share. And so I believe for the purposes of your five mil share calculation, they assume that we have those values, that we're able to tax on those values. Uh, prior year wasn't really much of an issue because it was the first year and so um, values were very, were very similar. Um, in reality to what they were on the digest for, but if, if revaluations continue to occur and they're occurring on houses owned uh, by individuals that are exempt, then we're not gonna collect that money, but it's still gonna be in the calculation for a five mil share that comes out of our state formula. So just be mindful of, of that too, as time moves on and we see that the county continues to revalue this digest. All right, Jen. This is just showing the, the change in our FTE accounts. Ultimately, we all know that our FTE stays in the same general range for, for many years, uh, but you can see uh, where we had a, a period of increase and now a period of decline uh, with our last count. So it has gone from 99.17 to 97.80 for the purposes of the calculation for the QBE formula. That QBE formula will take two October counts and it'll average in a projected March count to come up with that number, uh, but that's what we're funded on. So again, that that impacts um, that impacts our, our revenues. At the same time, uh, we use our student counts for staffing uh, formulas and patterns as well. So you have some offset with a decrease in expenditures. And do take into account that this FTE count does not include pre-kindergarten students. Correct. Students are funded separately. So we have about 460 or so pre-K students that you do not see as part of this count. Correct. Okay, Jenny. So this is just a, a summary of the various sources of revenue. Uh, we maintain federal the same for the most part. Our federal money is made up of JRTC. Uh, funds, which real it's depending on uh, dependent on our employees that we're, uh, 
and their experience levels from the Army, and uh, Medicaid reimbursements, which we um, just held basically constant. Uh, we're doing pretty well in those areas. Local revenues, uh, some decline really related off of interest and a combination of uh, some title level or tax and holding other things constant, but a big bulk of that is our interest revenues. On the expenditure side for items that are included, so again, we, we assumed a normal year uh, when we look at this. Uh, so 175 day school year for students and 190 day year for uh, teachers. Uh, so as we as we define that calendar and and look at the the trade-offs involved with that, you, you never have wholesale decreases of expenditures related to less days if you still plan on paying everybody the same. But uh, you have implications elsewhere where you can ultimately use savings from some configuration of your calendar. We also uh, include a longevity step for all eligible employees. So I believe as most of you know. Uh, we're required to get the step by law for all of our certified employees that are on the teacher salary scale. This board has traditionally uh, held it the same for all employees, uh, tried to do the same thing. Uh, this is one question we did want to pose with the board because of the, the timing of the budget. Uh, typically when we do this, you have 10, 11, and 12 month employees. And so right now, July would have the start of a new year for our 12 month employees, which include our custodians, maintenance workers, administrators, clerical staff. Uh, and so with the timing of, of this budget presentation, one thing we did want to get a feel from the board uh, is if they would allow us to ultimately do the step in July for 12 month employees. Um, otherwise, it's, it's, a, it's a budget item. Uh, if we waited until budget approval, it wouldn't go into effect until August uh, when the board finally adopts the budget. Uh, or again, it's, it's an item for a portion of the staff that can be excluded as well. But our, our request is uh, would, to plan on doing the longevity step for anybody that's on the scale that can have the step um, and to be able to start 12 month employees in July which is, it would be something that we'd be requesting as a consensus item. And you have already calculated that figure in, correct? Correct. It was included. We did this back in April, <laughs> April, May. It was already included in. And again, we got to do it for the certified. That will actually, since they're 10 month employees, that would take into effect or go into effect in September. Um, and we have a few classifications of employees that are rolled up as 11 month employees in August, but the majority are 12 month or 10 month. Uh, Mr. McElroy, can I ask you a, a, a question? Uh, sure. Uh, Road, uh, really two. Uh, with with, with the, the, re, the cuts coming from the state and with the uh, present situation that we're facing with the pandemic, has there been a discussion of the of the days for for students to be in attendance or and plus is can we can we even apply for a waiver because you know some people can't even finance you know the number of days so uh and then you got cuts coming from the state what what is it can you give us an update on on in the conversation if there has been any on, on those days, the fluctuation of those days. Let me, Mr. Holmes, if you allow me to answer that, I'll um, jump in here. The, the discussion of, of student days is one that we're going to be bringing up in part part of the, the board meeting itself as one of the implications of the September 8th start date. Okay. When we put, when we put out the August 12th date, our, our, our basic student year had been 175 days for students because we had taken five days and turned those into professional learning days across the district. When we moved back to the September 12 date in our, as part of option one a couple of weeks ago, that took five more days down to 170, but we could handle that. Moving to August, the uh, September 8th, 
removed an additional 23 days. We're really down to uh, right now with the September 8 start date. It's a 152 day student year unless the board changes the calendar. And tonight is part of the implications we'll talk about in option one, September 8. The length of the school year is one of those things we'll talk about in terms of just the number of days and how much you can get done in those days, but also trying to find a way to equalize the semesters, et cetera. But this budget was built on the 175 because it really, we weren't, we weren't, we weren't building any furloughs to anybody as part of this budget. Okay. Our work year pay was being impacted by this budget. So the 175, 152 didn't, didn't really matter from that regard. It really has more to do with making sure you've got enough work days for staff to meet their contractual obligations. And teachers 190 days, others, whatever particular contract or work year is. So if we can, we were looking tonight to get a consensus of the board to do this longevity step uh, roll up in order to be able to pass that on in the, in the proper sequence of 12 month in July, 11 month in, in August, 10 month in September. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, well, I'll uh, I'll just I'll go on with it, and then we could circle back around um, to to getting uh, the board board member thoughts. But uh, we do still have our employer contribution for our PSERS eligible employees. So for those that do not receive TRS, the board instituted a three percent. Um, amount basically that will go into a defined contribution plan for all of our um, do not have TRSs, primarily your nutrition workers, bus drivers, custodians. Uh, health insurance remained flat. They did not change that. And then I mentioned that TRS uh, had a decrease from the 21% to the 19%. And that decrease was determined before all of the, these external issues happened. I was expecting to see a rather large increase uh the the year after but they've already sent out a rate that's right around 20 percent, so it was not significant but again when they decrease trs that's a fairly significant cost for us so uh, we actually save more than they take out of our qbe formula so that's that's actually positive for us joni Uh, position changes, I mentioned that um, our FTE did decline, and so that ultimately affects our formulas. We have a, a uh, allotment formula pretty much for all uh, staff members at the school level. Uh, so with the decrease in the FTE, it ultimately resulted system-wide uh, in a decrease of 30 teachers off of that formula. It's the same formula that we put in place based off of the recommendations of the curriculum audit uh, to have equity factors included. Uh, but at the same time, we're also increasing uh, the number of special ed teachers based off of the actual students, where they are, and their IEPs. Uh, so you have a little bit of an offset in total teaching staff there, but it's, it's rather uh, the grand scheme of the 700 teachers we've got. And then the only real inclusions that are not um, formula based uh, that are additional requests really were around uh, what we've been experiencing the last uh, few months. And we know that the board had had conversations even prior to uh, the pandemic around counselors, mental health, uh, but we, we we felt like particularly in this time of of volatility and just the nature of what students are having to face right now. We looked at uh, including in this budget three mental health clinicians. Uh, really two of these are our counselors for the middle school level to be split between the four middle schools that will have a, a I guess a specialty uh, in mental health I'm probably butchering that and saying it wrong. Sarah's on the call as well, but but we wanted a, a particular skill set out of any counselors that we hired for the middle schools. Uh, but again, this was this was something that, despite the cuts, we felt like it was important enough uh, for 
for our student supports to go ahead and, and still include anyway. And then the two instructional technology technicians, as you can imagine, as we try to bolster um, the logistics around uh, more virtual learning, uh, we've looked at uh, including these two roles as well, uh, just, to, just to help us prepare for the logistics of, of really the decisions that you guys are looking at tonight and, and moving into the future. Uh, so those are the those are the two big highlights for actual inclusions um, outside of, outside of the formula that we use for this normal staffing. And these are the ones that I had mentioned. Brian, earlier. can I ask you a question? Sure. Mr. Chair, do I have uh, permission to uh, ask Mr. Michael a question? Absolutely. He said sure. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. McElmore, number one, it's really good to, um, to to see you on the line and see you presenting um, to everybody. But are you able to, when, it, when you talk about the COVID-19 addition on three mental health clinicians, counselor mental health, um, can you talk about any other funds that are associated with um, COVID-19 as far as the uh, grants and funds that um, were sit down from the on, from the federal government to our school district? Sure. So the main one uh, that, is, that is new to us, and, and Mr. Brown, you, it predates you on this board, but not significantly where we used to have uh, from the state what was called stabilization funds. And so when we went through the recession last time, and we were, I believe it was around 2010, the state of, had a a significant austerity reduction. And similar to that, the federal government at that time sent stabilization money to us. And we talked a little bit about this, I think in May, but they effectively adjusted what their uh, austerity reduction was as a minus to our formula, and then plugged in these stabilization funds as a positive right on the same earning sheet. So what it did was it sent the grants that were going to individual school districts to the state. Uh, so we have received from the CARES Act, uh, originally it was, it was 3.4 million and that's, that was the number we had working in this grant, uh, in this uh, budget presentation, but it's actually been increased a little bit and uh, I, may, I hope I'm not saying the wrong number, but it's a little less than 300,000 more, which is not factored into this budget right now. So that's, that's a positive that we've received since the development of this. So what we did was you'll see a, a decrease in overall expenditures for our general fund, but since the grant is accounted for separately in our special revenue funds, we have moved payroll expenditures over to that grant. And the payroll expenditures that we moved were our assistant principals. And so, if you look in the budget book and you look by school and you can see year by year comparisons and you'll see in school administration it decreasing a good bit because the assistant principals have been moved to use the money these stabilization funds uh, for this grant to basically offset 3.4 million dollars of the state re revenue cut and then we'll, we'll have to account for those and ultimately you uh, the goal is, is you're buying a year of time uh, and you, you move them back. Is that, is that the gist of what you were asking? Uh, yes, sir, that is. Mr. McLemore. Yes. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, under the COVID-19 thing there, it says the addition of three mental health clinicians. Yes. What What is the third? Am I just missing something here? The third was a true mental health clinician. It wasn't okay. necessary. It wasn't necessarily a counselor with a mental health uh, specialty. Okay. And, and again, I don't want to butcher this thing. So Sarah Jones is on here as well. But with the addition of these, I believe the plan is ultimately to uh, reallocate so that you have mental health clinicians slash counselors. Uh, a certain level of staffing for elementary, middle, and high. 
Okay. So we originally, we already had a three, I believe. And now with the addition of these, they would rework it so that they're dedicated to specific schools, depending on the grade band. Okay. Thank you. So really the, the, the purpose here is to address what we know will probably be some additional uh, social emotional needs. And you hear about that all the time as, as kids come back to school or continue virtual or what. This kind of goes along with what we used to call the Project Aware Grant. If you remember that name, and we still use that name around here. Is, and so um, we wanted to add a little more to that to that group so that they could serve our schools and the needs that are out there. And that's been a tremendous blessing for this district. And we also wanted to do some things specifically for the middle school in that area, but we wanted to have that mental health so that we could be addressing those issues that have become so prevalent in the last few years. And of course, at the bottom in the instructional technology, we see we're having more needs out there now with uh, with technology, and we felt like there was a need to add a little bit more to that to, uh, to bring us up. Okay, Jenny. Uh, these are some other expenditures that are included. They're typically within the thresholds of budgets that we've had in the past, but just to highlight some, some larger items, you have Fountas and Pinnell Classroom, uh, the Orton Gillingham Professional Learning, uh, we had a fairly significant amount in there for social studies kits and materials. We are continuing the behavior interventionist. Um, that was a big item in last year's budget where we have one full time at Ann Street and then the other five are divided uh, the uh, remaining 10 elementaries. Uh, Master and Connect and Map Software, those are foundational for the data that we ultimately collect and use to, to evaluate and analyze the programs. We do have a transfer in there to our pre-kindergarten program. Uh, I know there's some discussions, I guess, uh, around the format of the year that may have an effect on this number as well, because if you, if you, my understanding is if you go below a certain threshold of days, uh, they will look at cutting your state revenue. So uh, there can be some implications to the transfer and then workers' compensation, Mr. Holmes, I know you always look at this, but it's really held steady. That number, the same number it's been now for at least three or four years. Uh, but that's a transfer that we ultimately sent to that fund that we really track internally. Mr. McLemore, do you, do you mind if I uh, share a quick thought as well about the behavior interventionists um, that you just mentioned? This is Norman Sauce. Sure. Uh, I, I, I want to uh, just thank the board for its commitment starting last year to um, allow us to provide these positions at the elementary schools. Um, you know, obviously we didn't complete the year in person as we expected, but just to give the board some context, uh, we saw dramatic, dramatic year-to-year -year reductions uh, in elementary discipline incidents and the metrics of off suspension events and days, out-of-school suspension events and days. Uh, so we, we didn't end up with the true, you know, school year to school year comparison. Uh, but when you look at through March of 2019 and then through March of 2020, uh, we were on our way to some dramatic reductions and improvements in those metrics, uh, which I think elementary principals and, and elementary counselors would definitely attest to the support and assistance of behavior interventionists and the training that they were receiving through our MTSS team throughout the year, which was a great help as well. Um, so I just want to, from an elementary perspective, thank the board for that commitment and, um, you know, hopefully that we can continue with those positions this year. Um, because of the great benefit that we already know our, our data shows they were providing. So thank you for letting me chime in on that, Mr. McElroy. Right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sauce. Yes, yes ma'am. Right, Jenny. So overall, this is, this is the picture of our general fund. We are looking at using just over two and a half million of our reserves. As you may remember, some of our initial discussions were actually looking at uh, closer to four, four and a half million, with the plan being that what we were underspent last year, we would roll over. It'd be an increase to our fund balance that we would then use in FY21. Uh, we're closing the books right now. Byron's working hard. He's, he's definitely in a good time uh, as you have to close out the year and get ready for the audit but those numbers are tracking well. I believe they'll be above 2 million, which was our target. 
so the budget that we presented for uh, before you is is targeting that amount, but I think that your ending fund balance will will actually be better than that. Uh, so again, we're trying to use most of the savings from the prior year uh, that we had to really uh, give this board and um, staff time to prepare over the next year for the implications moving beyond FY21. Uh, again, for, with this budget, we were not looking at any furloughs. We're looking at doing the longevity steps. Uh, we're even looking at adding some supports for our students. Uh, and fortunately, we have that financial stability to be able to do that and, and buy that time. And let me let me add this, Ryan. That was that was a good summary of it. That the putting out here is very much the very much the program we have been having with a, with a few modifications that were mentioned. The two and a half million dollars that showed up on this slide, of course, is uh, you, you've got to keep in mind that we've also moved another about three and a half million dollars expenditures from the general fund to the special revenue fund, and we. CARES money to cover that. So the overall real deficit that we had to face this year is going to be closer to six, to six million dollars or more. And that's really what it is. Uh, and of course, we know that the, uh, the, the federal CARES money will probably not return again. So that will be a gap that will have to be looked at going into the fiscal 22 budget. Then we'll have to make um, see what happens with state revenues on the rest of the gap. But I'm very thankful that we have enough financial stability that we did not have to take some of the actions that people were talking about in terms of layoffs and furloughs, and those kinds of things. But we're able to continue with our not impacting our staff, but we are giving ourselves time to make some some opportunities for the future. That's that's great news. Ryan, I just I just wanted to make one comment. Being being here almost two months and 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 just looking at the data of what you're presenting, I want to just say that I'm very complimentary of you and Mr. Smith and this board because of 16.2 million projected ending fund balance is still about 17 percent, and you know the best practice on the state's 15 percent. You would have been we would have been 20 percent um, without the uh, some the, with the CARES money, for example, with the reduction in the reserve. So that's and, and on top of that, the board has conservatively rolled back taxes for many years. You don't see that in a lot of counties. So, I mean, that's that's something to really be proud of for all of those factors working together. And we're still sitting here at 17 percent. Because, Mr. Jones, let me let me correct you that that's the CT car, your fund balance. <laughs> He doesn't, know, he doesn't know that history, Mr. Uh, Ryan. He don't, he don't know that history, Ryan. You need, you need to explain it. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard of that one before. He, he's he's named and designated our fund balance after a, a board member, after a prior board member, whose focus was the fund balance. All right, Jenny. School Nutrition Services, again, I think we're all aware of the ripple effect of, of any kind of uh, school decision, uh, opening decision, day-related day decision. Uh, this, this grant was hit hard at the end of last year, and while we continue to serve meals, uh, the, the difference between in-person uh, daily participation versus uh, what people came for uh, when served at a location is significant. I want to say our average daily participation is somewhere in the mid to high 7,000 uh, range, whereas um, I believe the the number of meals being handed out were right at that 1,000 level, so a seventh. Uh, so as the board goes into these discussions about what the actual year will look like, we know this fund can get impacted quickly. And last year, we transferred a little over $600,000 to subsidize this fund. Again, that the offset of that is, is you typically have less general fund expenses, expenditures, so you, so you have the money there to transfer. So we just have to, to take those two things uh, in consideration in conjunction with each other uh, as, you, as you make those decisions moving forward. 
just like the general fund, we presented a budget for our school nutrition fund that assumed a normal in-person school year. Uh, it's a starting point, uh, but we also set an expectation that they would also use in that fund their fund balance as well. And because the fund balance for the nutrition fund has accumulated to about 20% uh, similar to the general fund. And so as the general fund is using its reserves, uh, we also plan on the nutrition fund to do that. We've pegged the amount 435,000, uh, but again, based off of the actual participation and day count that they have to serve meals, that can change pretty quickly. Do you want a little bit of drama in me? I'm sorry, did I hear a question? Okay. I think that was some background noise. Uh, okay. And we did not propose any increases to meal prices. Again, when you have a, a free and reduced rate that's close to 74%, you can raise meal prices all day long, but all you're doing is affecting a very small piece of your revenue, paid meals. And so that there is no increase uh, in this budget presentation work for that. Any questions about nutrition fund? All right, Jenny would be Ryan or um, Mr. McLemore, Mr. Jones, that being that um, how will we be able to uh, um, help for the cost of the scholars who, let's say, do not take option one for the FY21 year, do not take option one and they go strictly online? How will we be able to, um, it within our, you know, I don't know if it's gonna be special revenue or within our nutrition fund, how are we able to, you know, help, you know, fund a situation where scholars are still able to get meals? That's gonna to have to be discussed as part of our next uh, meeting. And any waivers that we have but right now, we're not aware of a waiver that we're gonna be able to use past that time. I believe I'm correct on that, Dr. Kennedy. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. Mr. Aiken? Yes, that, that is, um, is correct. I know uh, Mr. Uh, Robert Wheeler, our new uh, nutrition director, did receive some additional information uh, mm -hmm. regarding uh, the nutrition uh, guidelines, uh, but with the in person remote. Uh, prior to that information, that was correct. We did not have uh, the waiver that supported that in our range to be able to use at that time. But we can so, speak so, to that. So in other words, I guess yep. that's something that we can have more conversation about at the six o'clock meeting or, or we table that for another opportunity. Yes, we can have Mr. Wheeler speak to that uh, from his nutrition uh, discussions he's had with the state. During the system. Okay, all right. Thank you so much. Yes, there, there have been some updates, Mr. Brown, and this is this Anthony Akins. There have been some updates. I, 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 I can't uh, hear you say that again, Mr. Akins. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, there have been some updates. I was speaking with uh, Mr. Wheeler today, and he will be a part of the next meeting so we can. Uh, get an update from him on those waivers. Okay. All right. Thank you. Right. I mean, I'm just, as I'm looking at, as I'm looking at the budget and then also, um, where does, I, I see that, you know, as it relates to this, the special revenue fund and we, the uh, allotment of the initial budgets, but where does, as far as the dollar amount, and I don't know if this was in a previous slide, where does pre-K fall with this? I'm, I'm sorry, I missed, I missed part of that. Could you repeat the last part? I understand that we adopt initial budget and we have, um, you know, allotments coming in for fiscal year 21. And, you know, I was talking this morning with um, Ashley McLemore and she was talking about Title One, Title Two, Title Three, Title Four, and all these other things. I just want to know, as it relates to our overall budget for Griffin Spalding Schools, 
how much of that budget is made up from um, pre-K? Ryan, do you want do you want to speak to that, or Mr. Smith? So, uh, if you're if you're basically asking what is the budget for pre-K, which is located in our special revenue funds, it's it's right over two million dollars. Actually, Ryan, uh, just for clarification, uh, information we got from the state for our grant for this year, it's one point nine two seven million for this okay. upcoming yeah, so upcoming fiscal twenty one. One point nine two seven million. Yeah, and we and the general fund subsidizes an additional about one hundred seventy thousand plus. So the go. actual the actual level of expenditures that we have in that grant, because it does the the grant money doesn't pay for the whole program, is just over mm -hmm. two million dollars. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I guess okay. for at six o'clock, I would I would definitely like because I've had a lot of um, questions that come in as concerns about um, the start date and all that as it relates to pre-K. So I would love for Dr. Sauce to kind of touch on that as well. At six yep. <clears throat> that that won't be a problem, Mr. Brown. Also, Dr. Bearden will be joining us uh, at six o'clock. Uh, we've had numerous conversations with our Bright from the Start coordinator. Um, so we can we can certainly address uh, whatever questions you might have. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, Jenny. Uh, Splost five. We and we still have one collection to re receive for Splost five, but uh, contrary to what you would think, we've these last couple of months have been some of our highest collections. I think we had a we had one check. The last check went over nine hundred thousand dollars. So while uh, the economy as a whole is suffering, the actual amount of activity that generates sales tax for us is still doing well. Uh, so one more collection with that, and we'll probably end up being close to four million dollars ahead on SPLOS five, uh, which will then go into some of the conversations around how you use that. Uh, part of what we were doing uh, in the uncertain time was moving some of the planned projects that could be moved for SPLOS 6, such as your technology and buses, uh, to SPLOS 5 to say, take some of the, the burden off of SPLOS 6. Uh, but I also know there'll be other communications around capital projects as the year moves along. But uh, overall, SPLOS 5 did extremely well for us uh, as a system. And SPA 6 will receive our, our first collection in August uh, for the retail month of July. What is in the budget is basically using the assumption that we used when we um, uh, ran the campaign uh, and basically developed this whole thing. Uh, again, if you, if you base it off the past couple of months, uh, that's a conservative assumption. It's just that uncertainty that we, we left it there uh, just to equal what we've used before when we did our projections. Uh, but that will start soon. Jenny. And we have our final debt service payment. It's always nice to to pay off all your debt. Uh, so we have that. And because SPLOS 5 was so successful, uh, we easily have this covered. Uh, this this final payment will go out for the October 1st payment and then Griffith Spalding will have no debt. Jenny. Uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, capital projects is really just a projection of, of remaining budgets for projects in the various SPLOST. Uh, when you look at SPLOST 3 and 4, we really do not have a lot left uh, when it comes to, to projects. Uh, SPLOST 5, the, the main ones are still continuing this past uh, now, at uh, the summer. Um, on AZ Kelsey, the work done there, as well as GRCCA's aviation uh, program. And then ultimately, uh, some decisions will need to be made around buses and technology uh, that will come out of that. And then SPLOS 6, really the only items that we have uh, were technology related and safety uh, equipment related. Uh, one, the safety security equipment was to piggyback on money we were receiving from a state grant. and um, and as I mentioned, technology is really a split, uh, which is particularly important right now as we try to get in this virtual environment and get get to the one-to-one -one solution. 
Uh, SPLA 6, as a reminder, is pay as you go. Uh, so we, we need time to actually accumulate those checks um, before we start doing the larger renovation projects, which are really slated for FY22. I believe Spalding High was the first one on that on that project list. Jenny? Uh Miss Miss McAmore, on on, yes. on that uh the Taylor Street Central Office. Uh it's yes. been a while since we uh kind of addressed that. Uh is that the uh the renovations that that we saw and talked about, you know, earlier, like last year? Yes, yeah, so it includes the renovations. I think initially there was a plan uh, that was ultimately submitted, but it was it well exceeded the actual amount that we had. Uh, so a lot of that was was tailored back and reconfigured. But it does include uh, the boardroom, as we mentioned, it included uh, reworking some of the offices in the B building, the the long building in the middle, really to make it more accessible to the public as a one stop shop. Uh, for the, for the, when they come to campus and ultimately uh, seek various services for their students. So uh, there's a scaled down version, but honestly, it just kept getting reworked based off of uh, uh, what we spent with Memorial Stadium and um, really any other projects that also relate to Griffin High. And I believe it was Griffin High and Spalding High. Uh, we, the board has basically always taken a position of uh, completing and finishing anything related to the schools before we move on to central office. And uh, for this reason, it's gotten delayed a bit and scaled back. So, so uh, can I ask this uh, question? I know projects are on a pay as you go. And, and uh, people are kind of, you know, you know, once the word get out there that you're planning on doing something, you know, a lot of people don't understand the pay as you go methodology, but what, what's the projections that we'll be able to uh, start at least start on some of those projects? Cause I know, I know Spalding high is in desperate need uh, of some work uh, out there. So what, what uh, uh, do you have any kind of projections or start time or whatever? Just, I know you can't, be def defended it, but do you have any kind of idea of when those things might be able to get kicked off? Uh, what we can do is we can send an, an updated version of the timeline to the board. For the most part, large projects were FY21, but we didn't peg the month uh, that we were looking at starting. What we really didn't know was how, how the first few months of this SPLA cycle was going to go. And so our last discussion around uh, SPLA 6 was uh, what items can we go ahead and take care of with SPLA 5, which you can only do items that were slated on the ballot, and the only real crossover items are instructional technology and buses. Uh, so we want to go ahead and take care of those with SPLA 5 to take pressure off of SPLA 6 in case these first few collections were bad. Uh, they're not looking to be that bad. So that being said, we're hoping that we can raise in the first year eight to nine million dollars. And then you start comparing that to the timing of your actual projects and the, the total scope of, of what they, they planned on costing. Actually, you know, most of our schools will do over two summers a lot of times. So it's not that you have to have the entire cost of a project in one year. Um, but we didn't we didn't peg the actual uh, month that we would start Spalding High, for example, we really just wanted to make sure we'd be okay given that our SPLOS collections could de decline dramatically. But ultimately to answer your question, FY22, uh, that's what we're looking at for major renovation project. I'm just not sure the actual month that we'd be looking at that. Okay, thanks, sir. Uh, this is just a summary of what we talked about um, with, with the various funds, looking at maintaining the same property tax rate, uh, what, what the fund is built off of, the assumptions is built off of. I do want to circle back on the, on the longevity step and get the, the board's um, thoughts on being able to move forward with 12-month employees for that. Again, that includes 
and has administrators in there, it has custodians in there, it has maintenance workers and clerical staff primarily make up the 12 month people. I would be all in favor of that. I'm also in favor because those are those are step those are steps that have been earned and I certainly enjoyed mine when I got mine so I don't I don't see any reason not to personally. I'm just so thankful that we don't have any furloughs or uh, I'm real thankful for that. Uh, Mr. Holmes or Mr. Brown and Ms. Cook. Did I'm in favor also. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it, Ms. McMore. Yeah, I'm in favor with the budget as well. I just want to thank Ryan. I want to thank uh, Mr. Jones and Mr. Smith for all their hard work and everybody who uh, set at the table to put this together. And like I said, I am okay with what the superintendent is proposing. Um, that is one thing I probably would never the question the superintendent in is the budget because he's been doing that for many, many years. And I believe that we, we are in a good position financially because of him. And so um, I definitely uh, don't have a problem and is willing to accept it and, you know, move forward with it. Ryan. Yes, ma'am. Uh, is there any way we can get a copy of the book like we did last year that, that was printed up for us? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Jones has already, he he built those books this morning for everybody. Okay. So. Okay, thank th you. There is a physical copy available. I see you. I got my gun already. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, they got a special section in there on school board members? Yes, it does. You, it's you, in the front. It's did, specifically did you about you. Question? Did you get my, did you understand my question? A special <laughs> section on school board members? Yeah. I think Mr. Jones understands what I'm talking about. I'm still thinking about that call your questions. <laughs> <laughs> so we will have on the board meeting tonight the action item that is requesting to place the budget on first reading. Uh, and Mr. Jones will be presenting that with the various appropriation levels for the board to approve. That will then uh, kick off the advertisement that we'll place in the paper and the board will have an opportunity to discuss the dates uh, to hold the public hearings. I believe they're trying to work them into the next two board meetings including the workshop. Uh, so that will be on the agenda tonight. Again this is this is merely a presentation to uh, go over and highlight some of the inclusions in the budget as we built it and uh, the board always has the opportunity to um, uh, solicit more input and uh, use those public hearings to make a final decision. Um, also, is there any is there any way that I could get the Google Doc or a link for this presentation? Because I would like to share it. Um, I'm looking at my Facebook feed now, and people are, are asking about it. So, if I could get that in a link uh, within the next maybe 15 minutes, I can go ahead and post to so that parents can see it and look at it. So when we start to um, advertise and announce the public hearings, they'll have this information um, readily available to them. Mr. Brant, it's linked in the assembly, in the agenda. But we can I'm we sorry. can copy and paste it and send it to you. Yeah, so, I, so what happened, the link in the agenda actually pulls it up as a, um, not a PDF, but as the actual PowerPoint. And so if oh. I could just get that copy and paste and sent to me, I can go ahead and send it out. Okay. Appreciate okay. You. okay, we'll convert it to a PDF then and share it to you. Thank you. All right. Are we gonna go over the timeline that's- uh, Yeah, Joan, one more slide. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so after tonight, we'll look at placing it on first reading and then uh, tomorrow morning send it off to the, the paper as well as put it on our website, the full budget book, uh, the link to the full budget book and um, and then target uh, August the August 4th meeting right before that for a work session and our public hearing as well as final adoption on the workshop meeting on the 18th where we can do the public hearing first thing. Yeah, we're required to have two public hearings and workshops on or any other workshops you want to add to that 
but we thought it'd just be convenient if we could put the public hearings on times we already had a board meeting going on and then that wouldn't be so confusing to the public as to when they would be. I think it's a great idea. Board members, are there any additional questions before we move on? Uh, hearing none, um, I have about 15 minutes until six. And so I do not believe we have enough time to go into an executive session after this meeting. I think getting the uh, 15 minute break or a few minute break would be more important on um, bladders. And um, so uh, hearing uh, no other questions or anything, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So just, just have a question. Do we still use we use this link for the six o'clock meeting or just stay where we are? No, you, I think Different you got to go to the other one. I, I, I don't think yep. I ever got that. No, you can use it. It's all the same link. Okay, all right. So if I stay in this same room, I'm good? Yes, yes. ma'am. Thank you. All right. Um, I had a motion, and did I get a second? Yeah, yeah, you got two motions, so one of them can be a second. There we go. All in favor signify by raising your right hand so we can see it. All right, we will see you guys back in about 15.